Okay, uh, first we'd like to dedicate this and all the lessons to Gail Malka Meister, of blessed memory, there she is. Uh, Gail created the Days of Learning in 2019 to create profound connections through congregant to congregant teaching and learning through a Jewish lens. With her unique mix of intellect, style, humor, and warmth, she made Days of Learning the vibrant adult education offering we anticipate with the excitement each time it's offered. She led our planning group with flair and sensitivity, and she demonstrated deep commitment to making each day of learning class the very best it could be. She lives on in our hearts as we cherish her memory. Uh, so we welcome everybody, and nice to see such a nice, diverse group of people, and I'm sure there are more diverse people out there in the Zoom land, and uh, thank you for coming in person. Uh, I'm Jerry Silverman, and uh, the course, the class is fresh from Israel, and we're very excited, especially because I know Elaine's been there before, but this was Steve's first trip to Israel, and he must be like beside himself. He can't wait to hear his reactions. Uh, let me remind you that afterwards there'll be 15 minutes more time if you want to hang around and, and chat and eat some more food, okay? Uh, and our tech angel is Susan Bear somewhere. Oh, she's right in front of me. Okay. Uh, the class is being recorded, and if you're not interested in being recorded, and turn your video off if you're in the Zoom. The class will utilize closed captions, and if you are on Zoom, please put your pronouns on the screen, on the chat, and we'll start with a prayer for study. You can say it along with me if you know it. Baruch Ata Adonai. Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Asher, Kitshanu, B'mitzvotav, V'tzivanu, La'asok, B'divrei, Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of all, who hallows us with mitzvot, commanding us to engage with words of Torah. And with that, I think that we're going to dive in. A couple more minutes. Are we at the dance or something? I, I, you don't want me to hear me sing, I know that. I can tell jokes. Are you ready yet? Yes? Now? Okay, go for it. Oh, sorry. I want to thank Ray Stokes as well as Susan Bear, who is uh, making sure that all of our tech runs correctly tonight. And I want to give a very big thank you to Ellen Poster, who... Uh, brought this program as an idea and has worked so hard with us to bring everything to fruition. So, Ellen, thank you. We've organized our presentation not following the route that we traveled through the country, but rather in categories, historical sites, technology, the arts and culture, culinary, recreation, and spiritual experiences. We are not going to be discussing uh, Judea and Samaria, divisions between the religious and the secular. That was not what our trip was about, and so we're not addressing it in this presentation. There will be time for questions. Uh, after technology, we'll have about a five-minute break to, for you to ask your questions, and uh, at the end, so, as Jerry said, we are extending this presentation to 7.15, and that's how we have scheduled it all. So, if you can stay with us and wish to, we'd love to have you. Um, those who are here, please write your question on the 3 by 5 card on your table and give it to Susan, and she will ask the questions for everyone. And those who are attending by Zoom can write their questions in the chat to Susan. As you can see, Susan will be very busy. <laughs> so we have several overall. Oh, we're going to start starting here. Oh, okay. you, oh I thought. Yep. Go okay. Uh, the first thing I'd like to ask is how many people have been to Israel? 
Oh, lots, isn't that wonderful? And I can't really see the Zoom audience, but I assume it's the same. And I'm sure several have not. So what is it that we can offer you tonight? We are certainly not in any way experts. We simply want to share some unusual highlights that even people who have been to Israel may not have seen. And we want to share with you our personal impressions and our great enthusiasm for that magical country since we are, as the title of our presentation says, fresh from Israel. Thanks. Now we do have some overall impressions. It's such a cultural modern country. If it wasn't for the 10 or 11 hour flight, in some respects you wouldn't know you left the United States. In some other respects, it's very, very obvious. Israel, similar to the United States, is the United Nations. We've interviewed a lot of people because of curiosity. Elaine took the lead in this. Uh, we interviewed the Jewish concierge from India, the Sudanese Muslim Mater D, the Mexican Christian waitress, the German Winter, the Native American Kibbutznik, and the French and British staff at the Hotel Shalom. We did this because these people have all made Aliyah, and for them, Israel is the land of opportunity. They're very happy to be there. It changed their lives, and it's a wonderful place for these people. We found the Israelis themselves very kind and very helpful. After services at an Orthodox synagogue, they were sure to include us in their lunch. Uh, one day when we were having trouble hailing a cab, a guy just stopped on the street and helped us with a zap. And then, not zap, app. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, one night we went to a, a very nice performance and walked out into a desolate, dark area we asked the gentleman if he could uh, tell us where he was going to wait for a cab. He said, no, I'm going to take you home with me. We jumped into his uh, rover, and he took us right to the hotel room, which was not in his normal direction. Right. Pressing. Hang on. Okay, there we go. So Steve and I were in Israel for three weeks. We were on our own in Tel Aviv for the first week, and we then joined our two-week tour. We traveled with Margaret Morse Tours, and they did a superb job. We recommend that company very highly. They spared nothing, and their guide was excellent. Here is a map of Israel, and we proceeded in a circle. We started in Tel Aviv, Yafo, then went up to Caesarea, then to Haifa, then to Akko, Sfat, the Upper Galilee and the Golan, then coming down on the uh, east side, Tiberias, Jerusalem, Masada, and the Dead Sea, all the way down to the southern tip, Eilat, and then flew out of Tel Aviv at the end. However, we have, as I said, organized our presentation not as we traveled through the country, but rather in categories. So we're going to start with the historical sites. And um, the one I would like to tell you about first, which was so interesting, I think, uh, I think our clicker falls asleep a little bit in between. Oh, OK. So when you travel through Israel, the beauty of it is that you go from the ancient, and here we are in Yafo, which is known to be easily 4,000 years old, its lovely alleyways of golden stone, to the cutting edge. This is a desalination plant, and next. The Ashdod performing arts center. So you can see how very modern uh, Israel is. This was our first uh, uh, historic site, the Ayalon Institute, and it was so interesting. Here's a bit of background. David Ben-Gurion was aligned with the Haganah, which was the main Zionist paramilitary organization of the Jewish population, defending it against attacks from the Arabs. Haganah practiced restraint 
and Ben-Gurion for many years believed in working with the British, who were in charge of mandatory Palestine at that time. He was in opposition to Menachem Begin, head of the Irgun, who believed that working with the British would never produce an independent Israel. And Irgun was a much more aggressive organization and not opposed to practicing military violence. However, after many years, Ben-Gurion and the Zionist leaders came to the conclusion that the British were never going to cut the Jews a decent deal, that negotiations were not going to lead to an independent state, despite the pronouncements of Britain's Balfour Declaration. Why? Very important. The British Navy had switched their entire fleet from coal to oil as the source of energy. The Arabs had oil. The Jews had nothing to offer that the British were really interested in. Ben-Gurion saw that it was going to take a battle to get independ an independent Jewish homeland. The problem was that while the Jews could fashion guns, and they had fashioned them, there were 34 parts, and they made those 34 parts in 34 locations, only assembling them at the end. They had no ammunition, no bullets. So they, had, they came up with the idea of making a secret bullet factory disguised as a kibbutz, a kibbutz for laundry and baking right under the noses of the British who had a base nearby, very nearby. They built housing, a dining hall, structures, a vegetable garden, a chicken coop, um, all on the surface, as well as the laundry and the bakery, and under to conceal what was going on below, eight meters below, that there was an ammunition factory that was the size of a tennis court with walls two feet thick, and the entire factory was completed in 22 days and operated for three years. Well, you can imagine there were many challenges. Um, I'd like to go back. There were many challenges. How to conceal the noise of this uh, ammunition plant? And there was a lot of noise because they had to test the bullets to be sure that they were, would, would shoot accurately. So. The laundry was run 24 hours a day, making cover-up noise. And here's an irony. The laundry did such a good job that the British gave all their uniforms to the, <laughs> to the kibbutz for laundering. And to keep the British off site as much as possible, the uh, kibbutz said, oh, we will do pickup and delivery services as well. <laughs> now, what happened? OK. Um, so, mm. all right, well, the, um, the drums of the washer and the 10-ton the uh, baking unit could swing out on metal runners, and that is when, oh, yep, yeah, well, we really do need that picture from before. Okay, just do it that way. Okay, that's easier. Okay, so you can see um, the drum being swung to the side, and you see that hole in the ground, and then on the right, you see people from our uh, tour going down a spiral staircase to the ammunition plant. I should say factory, it wasn't a plant. And here, you see on the right, the bullets are being shot. This is the testing area. Well, now what about the fact that 45 people were working underground, and they weren't suntan, like all the rest of the kibbutzniks. So as not to raise suspicions of the British, they set up a tanning unit with a sun lamp, and they looked like everybody else. Uh, the kibbutz was continuously visited and watched by British soldiers. So the kibbutz gave them beer to sort of distract them. The British complained you know, this beer is so warm. So the kibbutznik said, if you give us warning that you're coming, we'll chill it for you. <laughs> Very clever. <laughs> the, uh, the British fell for it. The work in the ammunition factory was difficult and dangerous and dirty, and the penalty for engaging in this illegal activity was death. 
At its peak, the factory produced 40,000 bullets a day, more than 2 million in a three-year period. And this ammunition was crucial to the early success of the Jewish fighters. I uh, love this site because it just shows the tremendous courage and resourcefulness of the early settlers. Okay. This is Atlit. Atlit is another site that illustrates how problematic, indeed cruel, the British were in the establishment of Israel. It's a detention camp set up by the British to hold Jewish refugees who had entered Israel illegally. Some background, the Balfour Declaration was a public statement issued by the British government in 1917 during World War I, announcing support for the establishment of, and I quote, a national homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine. In 1922, the League of Nations put the Balfour Declaration into effect in the British Mandate of Palestine, again establishing a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. But there was a provision that was problematic, and that was that <clears throat> this homeland be uh, created in such a way as to not interfere with the rights of existing non-Jewish communities there. Well, as the Jews entered, the, uh, the Jewish refugees, the Arabs staged massacres and riots against them. And in response, the British, trying to accommodate the Arabs, created the White Papers, which restricted Jewish immigration and land purchase. And the final White Paper effectively abandoned the agreed-upon creation of a Jewish state in violation of the League of Nations decision. It limited Jewish immigration to 75,000 people over a five-year period. Now, that is 15,000 people a year at a time when six million Jews were trying to escape the Nazi horrors and no country would admit them, including the United States. <clears throat> so the Jews had to be surreptitiously slipped into Palestine. You may remember the famous film Exodus and the book. And the, the shocking thing is that the British would then go out and literally round them up seek them out and round them up and put them in detention camps, one of which was Atlit. Tens of thousands of Jews were held there over the years. Perhaps, uh, and here you see a picture of all the bunks, the picture on the left where they were held. There were 4,000 at Atlit for, at a time. And on the right, you can see the conditions in which they were kept. This is what impressed us about it at least. It was so similar to the concentration camps. Detainees were stripped, deloused, and confined to these primitive spaces. Of course, the main difference is they weren't intending or trying to, to murder them as the Nazis were. But in so many ways, they did exactly what the British, what the Germans had done to them. I am made of you noticing we do have um, a little bit of this presentation about the independence or pre-independence of Israel. That's because it was part of the tour, because it was so emotional for us, and we think particularly with so many people having been to Israel, there might be some byways that you haven't experienced. That brings us to Akko. <clears throat> Akko is another reminder that Jews need their homeland of Israel to be free because when it comes to world politics, Israel is given a backseat to major powers. Akko was a former crusader fortress, then an Ottoman palace, and it was turned into a prison by our so-called protector Great Britain. After announcing that Palestine, Palestine on both sides of the Jordan River, uh, as Elaine had said, would be reserved for Jews, but according to the Balfour Declaration, the British reneged. Their global strategy, as she said, uh, was oil and not Jews. And then, therefore, they created Akko, which was a British-run prison to hold Jews who were working to make Israel a reality. The first prison was somebody you probably heard of, the commander of the Jewish Defense of Jerusalem, 
Zev Jabotinsky and 19 members of his defense forces. They were protecting people against Arab massacres and against British um, interference. The British developed a nice little habit of hanging Jews who caused trouble. Menachem Begin, though, put a stop to that. He informed the British that he would hang one of their soldiers each time they hang one of his. The British thought he was bluffing. Uh, you know Menachem Begin was not bluffing, if you know anything about him. When he hanged two British soldiers that end the gallus. But not before the British had hung nine young men, some so young that by law, the day of death had to wait until their birthday. Up in the Golan Heights, it's, it's a wonderful place. Um, that's Mount Erman. It shows that Israeli security problems did not end after independence. They've had six wars, two intifadas, terrorist attacks, and everything else. We see Israel in the north, the beauty of Mount Hermon with skiing, farming, forest trails. But we also see at the same time in the right-hand picture, Lebanon is to the left, Syria is to the right, Israel is to the center. Syria, uh, as you may know, is a base for Iran, which has expanded hegemony, uh, uh, hegemony over the area. And that's especially serious now because the United States have stepped out of the area and Israel has to face this as an existential threat from Iran. When you're up there, you'll see it's literally a stone's throw between the three countries, and two of which, uh, which in the past or present, and I would say the, the present, have sworn to eliminate the country of Israel and the Jews who live there. So, in order to enforce the Never Again Pledge, Israel employs almost universal conscription, including women. The soldiers we see here can appear anywhere, as on the left, Mount Herzl Cemetery, and on the right, Ben Yehuda Shopping District in Jerusalem. The last soldiers were deployed to the streets just right after the terrorist attacks that took place while we were in Israel. The soldiers are high school graduates, young kids who defend their country and get an education in the armed forces. It's a very interesting street because you see street dancers, Israeli dancers, doing all sorts of uh, the fun thing there. So now we're off to Bet Shean. In ancient times, little Israel faced big security problems even before it was Israel. Wealthy countries such as Mesopotamia, Egypt, Anatolia, which is Turkey, and India exchange finished products and raw materials along the trails that cross Israel, along the coast, which was the major one, through the Negev, a minor one, which Abraham favored, and along connection routes between them all, up and down the Jordan Valley, or through the Judean fills, hills by way of what they call the Je Je Jezreel Valley. That little mountaintop there, is where the city of Bet Shean was for many, many years. And it's the, it, it overlooks the important intersection of everything. Therefore, it was always contested by Canaanites had it, Egyptians had it, Israelites had it, Philistines had it, David took it back, and then Romans took it back. And those are just those in the ancient world. Romans made it an administrative centerpiece with an impressive amplifier, shopping promenade, baths, and a circus amphitheater for chariot races. The glorious city came to an end, however, in the year 749, which buried the city. It's very interesting, in modern times, after that earthquake, the Roman city was unobservable. However, they knew something was there. A kibbutz with a linen factory ran into hard times Unemployment was large. A bright mayor said, well, let's dig up that city or whatever's on there. He provided employment for his unemployed. I guess he kept his job because when they dug it out, they found this marvelous city, Roman city, which is called the Israeli Pompeii. It's very worthy of a visit. And if you do have the energy, you can walk up to that Bet Shean on top, which is just a ruin. Uh, but is very, very uh, ancient and very important. 
That's where the prophetess Deborah defeated the king of Hazor, and that's where King Saul lost to the Philistine and was hanged by the walls with his sons. Still a little bit on this history, then we'll get off this particular history. Masada is Roman era. Anybody who's been there, I'm sure, has been up there. At the end of that ill-advised rebellion against Rome, the remnants of the resistance made a last stand on top of that hill. On top of that hill is actually a palace. It was a ref, uh, refuge for Herod, King Herod. The zealots took that over. They hid there for three years. They took advantage of all the engineering feats that Herod had implemented. There are cisterns, storehouses full of grain, bears, and mikvahs. But it was a doomed effort. In the end, the Romans did outmaneuver and outnumber them. But what makes this place so important in history is that rather than provide the Romans just another little battle in their scourge of the area, the rebels made a statement that has resounded throughout the centuries by conducting a mass suicide. Down south, this is one of my favorite places because it's so unknown. This is in the Negev, very close to a lot, 15 kilometers north of a lot to be exact. Now, of course, the negative is over half of Israel's landmass. And it has a lot of the history, a lot of it uncovered. Torah says that Moses had to pass through this area. Research confirms this. In fact, archaeologists in Timna National Park, and this is fairly recent, have uncovered quite a few historic objects. For instance, a bronze snake, similar to that described in Torah and used by Moses to cure bites. I wasn't so familiar with that until we went there. There is the small temple to the Egyptian cow goddess Hathar, which was destroyed by Israelites, suggesting the presence of the golden calf worshiping and a possible explanation of the golden calf incident in Torah. It's concluded that in this vicinity was the famous tent of meeting, described in such detail in Exodus. The park rangers and archaeologists have agreed with this idea. They erected a crude tent of the meeting. It shows an estimated sign, certainly not the embellishments with all the different colors of uh, fabrics and linen and wool, but that's about the size they estimate that the tent of the meeting was. Very fascinating to see the intersection of Israeli history here. There's hiking, exploration of caves, exploration of copper mines, and a visitor center for getting more information on the Timna site, another high recommendation. We move to technology, which is uh, an area I find just so fascinating. Ben-Gurion famously quipped, in Israel, in order to be a realist, you must believe in miracles. In a world of technology and innovation, Israel is a leader in miracles. The country has as many tech startups per capita as anywhere else in the world and is second only to the U.S. in venture capital funds. This is an important feat for any country, an amazing feat, but more so for one that is only 74 years old and only has um, just over 9 million people. So here are some of the amazing technical, uh, technological accomplishments that we learned about. Water, the world's precious resource, which is in short supply and promises to be the next battleground between countries. In the Middle East, an area of the world so challenged by water shortage, Israel has gone from a country with too little water to, believe it or not, a surplus. How is that possible? Usually governments respond retroactively to problems. But several years ago, the Israeli government saw that water would be a tremendous problem as its population grew. And it got to work uh, using three attacks. One was conservation. Israel managed to reduce its water demand by 20% years ago, which is a tremendous accomplishment when you think of how we've tried to do 
something similar and have not been successful. Here's an example of technology Israel developed even earlier to save water, the famous drip irrigation, which changed the desert to a green land by using these um, hoses with holes that drip just enough water into the roots of each plant rather than spraying and wasting at large. And with this technique, whoops, sorry, look what it has done. In the uh, background of the picture, you can see the desolation of the land, the desert. Israel is 60% desert. And then in the foreground, you see the JNF forestation, how it has turned the land into something so green and beautiful. Recycling as a second um, <coughs> measure. Israel leads the world in recycling. Look at this chart. It's really astonishing. Israel recycles 86% of its water. The closest is Spain at 17%. And the US, depending on uh, which statistics, 1%, maybe 5%. It uh, recycles personal use wastewater and uses it for agricultural and industrial needs. It even has set up two separate systems of pipes side by side, white for the fresh water, purple for the recycled water so people don't make a mistake. <laughs> the third is desalination. Israel has five desalination plants that can supply a huge percentage of all the people's personal use water needs. You can see what a sophisticated operation it is. Another remarkable innovation, WaterGen, that's the name of the company. You see here a generator that takes water out of the air and turns it just out of thin air and turns it into pure drinking water. Many of these are set up in field hospitals that Israel brings to countries suffering from disaster, especially in, in areas where there's little water. And just today, I read about how Israel is giving these water gens to Syria, to the Gaza Strip, and water gen is in 85 countries. Israel reaches out all over the world to share its water technologies Water technology may be one of its most important political and diplomatic strategies. Okay, date pollination. Natural pollination might lead to one of every two or three flowers getting pollinated if you were depending on bees and birds. Instead, standing on these orange special platforms that the Israelis have uh, constructed, <coughs> people gather the pollen from male trees, then they spray each of the flowers on the female trees, <laughs> and they get such a huge crop that the branches can't even support all the dates. They have to tie them up. And then they release donkeys to eat the weeds at the base of the trees and leave their droppings, which fertilize the trees. So they've They've attacked that, uh, uh, the problem from, well, they have created so many ways of uh, multiplying date pollination to two or three times what nature would produce. Now, I don't have a picture of this, but I call it Algae Viagra, a joint venture with Japan with, uh, through the company known as NBT, grows blue-green algae, and you, there's a, a whole plant where that's done. It's Japan's answer to Viagra, and the Japanese men swear by it, to the tune of $6,000 a pound. <laughs> they pulverize the algae and put it in little capsules and sell it in a bottle. Okay, a tech combo of milk, wine, and energy. So on the right, you see the windmills. There are windmills, there are uh, solar farms. You see on the left of that right-hand picture, if you can hardly see it, uh, vines. So um, vines for producing grapes for wine and cows. We saw these cows just uh, ambling and grazing everywhere and we wondered, does, it, does anybody own these? 
Well, in fact, Israel keeps a complete history of every single cow, and it has developed some exceptional ways to increase milk production. Last year, one cow set a world record, 5,283.44 gallons of milk in one year. <laughs> bees. The disappearance of bees presents a tremendous threat to human life. It is estimated that if all bees disappeared, human beings could only survive an additional four years. So Israel has developed nucleus, nucleus hives. They put a queen bee, some worker bees, and everything they will need for a week. And in that week, they're shipped to a destination that has suffered from a, uh, a precipitous fall of bee population. The beekeepers simply open up the Israeli hive, put it into a dormant or new hive, and voila, they have a running beehive. I just want to mention that in uh, our Staying Connected, our, our weekly um, publication from RS, um, I put in a, right and oh yes, it, uh, Ned is our chairperson of Israel Connectors. I was going to make a little pitch at the end for anyone to join who's interested. Um, we put in a factoid about these marvelous things that Israel is doing. Uh, so I apologize, but um, I think we cannot do our mid-program uh, questions. We will save them for the end. We were a little slow with the technology to start. Okay. Um, as an arts lover, I absolutely uh, am thrilled by the arts and culture scene in Israel. So often, all we read about related to Israel are the politics and the military confrontations. And so you start to think, well, that's what Israel is. But when you go there, it comes as a surprise, maybe even a shock, to see how culturally developed this country is. It has arts plazas that are fully comparable to those you would see in any major city of the world. Please take a note as I go through these of the architecture itself. This is a picture of the Charles Bronfman Auditorium. It is home to the Israeli Philharmonic. Um, Zubin Mehta, the famous conductor, ha was conductor for 50 years. He recently passed the baton to a young Israeli. This is the Habima Theater, which is right next to the Bronfman. <clears throat> and uh, here, this is a venue for theater. Very beautiful. This is the Tel Aviv Performing Arts Center, where uh, we ended up that night that we were looking for a taxi when it was so dark, and as that Steve described. Um, you can't see it from this picture, but there are any number of buildings that are part of this one square city block performing arts center. This is the Tel Aviv uh, Museum of Art from two different angles. Look at the wonderful architecture. I can tell you that on the day that we visited, not hundreds, but thousands of people arrived to look at the art exhibitions that were there and they were coming by the hundreds through the door and in the time that we were there in those few hours there was just a continuous entrance of hundreds of people the Israelis so value culture this is the white city a UNESCO world heritage site in Tel Aviv it's a heritage site because Tel Aviv has more of the Bauhaus or international style buildings than any city in the entire world. Uh, architects came from Germany and uh, Austria. They emigrated to Israel in the 20s and 30s, and this was the style that they brought with them. Compare that to modern architecture. Look at, this, at the buildings on the left. There's such a boom in building. And um, on the right, my favorite building, the Azrieli Tower near the Sirona Market. Any, um, a view, uh, uh, from any angle, this building is fascinating. We can only see it from one angle here. 
when you go into the art museum, you will, which was the vision of uh, Mayor Dizengoff, who was the first mayor of uh, Tel Aviv, you will see a gift that Chagall gave him to open the museum, the famous rabbi painting, and on the right, the Chagall stained glass windows at Hadassah Hospital. There are 12 windows, three on each side, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. So you go from this famous art to street graffiti. This is a section called Florentine. It's, an, it's a gritty um, neighborhood in Tel Aviv, but it's a place that the young people can afford because Tel Aviv is either the most expensive or the next to the most expensive city in the world for real estate. So the young people are always looking for places they can live, and uh, we just love this explosion of street art. The Judaica in Israel is phenomenal. On the left, you see the kind of cases for Torah that are made in the east, gold and silver and uh, gemstones. On the right, you see the 12 mezuzot representing the 12 tribes. There are so many of these um, beautiful mezuzah uh, collections made by artists. The famous Anu uh, Museum, the Museum of the Jewish People. Anu translates to us. To be a Jew, uh, Amos Oz said, almost always means to relate mentally to the Jewish past. But I would say that's not a necessarily true because when we look around at the diversity in Road of Shalom, there are lots of people who do not relate necessarily to a Jewish past but have chosen to join the Jewish people. One of the things I loved was um, a photographic display of Jewish families, atypical, you might think, Jewish families. There's a fabulous uh, um, exhibition of the arts at Anu on the right, you see Jerome Robbins, the famous choreographer. He's choreographing West Side Story. On the left, you <laughs> may not know this, but Hindu women in India were not permitted by their religion to play roles in the movies. And so many Jewish women were the actresses in that early Bollywood industry. This is the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. By the way, Anu was in Tel Aviv. That is, uh, on the left, you see a display of a, a scroll, um, a Dead Sea scroll. And on the right, you see the actual little uh, uh, pieces of close-up of the Dead Sea scrolls. And there's so many things you can see in that museum, all of which are fabulous. They have transported synagogues, which you see on the left. They have weights and measures and jewelry from ancient um, Israel. Okay, food, glorious food, something we all can relate to. On the left, you see a display of Mediterranean foods, hummus, tahina, uh, falafel. On the right, the fascinating things that Israelis do with salads. They make salads that you just never thought of, and every night at the hotel, there would be displays like this. So if you see the salad display and how extensive it is, you should know that there were 10 such stations. One was chicken, and one was meat, and one was bread, and one was vegetables, etc. And then the desserts. <laughs> Look at those desserts. This is fascinating. You would think, how could you have a really good creamy dessert after a meat meal, and all the hotels were kosher? Well, I spoke to the chef. They mix up a vegetable-based milk product like soy or almond with fat and sugar. They whip that up, and they can make anything that you would normally think would have to be dairy. And on the right, you see stuffed dates. And now, that is Steve in the blue coat, and he's about to dive into his favorite breakfast, shakshuka which is eggs poached on top of a delicious red sauce. And um, we, are, we had a, a really fun time making our own lunch. You can see the chefs um, towards the back of the photo and our group ready to slice and dice. There I am on the left making the red sauce for the shakshuka. 
On the right is the focaccia bread that we made to go with this meal. I do want to say this is so delicious. Shakshuka is eaten by the Israelis for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I brought recipes for shakshuka if you would like to take one home. It's really yummy. And I just had to take these pictures to show you the kinds of extravagant, wonderful, abundant food there is. On the left, this is the just a little cookie shop in the Hadassah um, Hospital Food Court. All of those kinds of cookies. On the right, spices that you see in so many Israeli markets. So we said that 60% um, of the country is just this desolate. It is desert. Um, and that's why you can understand why the Israelis so love the opportunity to be in nature that is so green and lush. So they take every opportunity to go up to the upper Galilee where these pictures were taken. And it was this way when we were there because it had been a wet, cold winter that produced great green fields. We stayed at a um, kibbutz in the upper Galilee, Hagoshrim. You can see why this is such a draw for weekenders or uh, full week vacationers. There are the children at the kibbutz being cared for while their ch uh, parents go to work. But unfortunately, as is required in a kibbutz and so many other places, a bomb shelter for when the bombs start to come across. Okay, E. Well, I want to mention there's a lot more to Israel than history and technology, even than food, and more than we can cover here or that we witnessed. However, everybody should know Tel Aviv was designated the world's most fun city in 2021. Some of you may have heard about it by Time Out magazine. And that is in part because they have a vibrant club uh, scene where young people party late into the night. Elaine and I partied up to about 9 o'clock. <laughs> uh, but we did do our best to have some of uh, the Israel fun. And as the saying goes, whatever floats your boat. There we are floating our boat in the Dead Sea, which because of its very high salt content makes floating very simple. But there is a word of warning there. Uh, a person that is that we, what we might call generous size, there's a lot of trouble standing up. I mean a lot. We had one guy, he panicked. Uh, he was floating and having a good time, and he couldn't stand up. Uh, his wife and I did get him up, though. Adult fun always improves with a little bubbly. This is the Golden Golan Heights Winery. Just a great place for tasting, a great tour, and great brands, which make their way into the United States. We incurred uh, some, a couple places here, believe it or not, now that we're aware of it. There are many wineries in Israel, and the quality of the wine is quite respectable. I'm just going to say here that this gentleman was one of the people who not too long ago made Aliyah. He was from Germany. Every, every other sentence he says, ja, ja, ja. Um, now we want to point out that no vacation is complete without a bit of shopping. Here on the left, we have sent our RS representative out to check out the goods, the brands. <laughs> this is at the Jaffa Shuk, but don't worry if you miss the Jaffa Shuk. There's plenty of other, especially in Tel Aviv and in Jerusalem. There's traditional entertainment avant-garde and more straightforward. This particular one was a night in Paris at the Tel Aviv Performing Arts Center. Uh, there was a very risque one. I won't go into too much detail about it, but they have that too. Um, there's also the Baha'i Gardens in Haifa. We didn't get right into them. There wasn't time, but uh, it is a wonderful place. You can see from the uh, top-down photographs there's uh, hot springs in Tiberias. And while you get to the wall, we weren't going to go into that too much because everybody uh, has been there or is going to go there soon. 
They have a new spectacular sound and light show, which celebrates Jerusalem's 4,000-year history as projected onto the wall at Jerusalem Tower of David, right next to the wall. We proceeded down to Elat, a great resort, a great shore resort. It has swimming in the sea. We tipped our toes in there. Snorkeling, scuba diving, theaters, a boardwalk atmosphere in the hotel district. From our hotel, uh, and this is a little interesting observation. This is from our balcony. You see Israel straight down there with the docks and the trees. To the far left is Saudi Arabia. To the middle left is Jordan. Swinging around to the right, that little hilly area, is Egypt. And that's just how close you are all the time, driving up and down the desert. Right over 20 feet to the left is uh, Egypt or another country. Uh, everything is just that close in, um, in Israel. To go to Israel is also to seek and hopefully have a spiritual experience. You might have that in Spot, also pronounced Safed, which is the highest city in Israel, far up north. It's the mystical center of Israel, the center of Kabbalah. And it is here that the mystic Shlomo Albaketz wrote the song that we sing every Friday night to welcome the Sabbath, L'cha Dodi. And he used to stand at the top of these steps with his followers to welcome the Sabbath, and they would sing that song. And it's here also in Spot that Rabbi Joseph Caro wrote the Shulchan Aruch, which is the most widely consulted code of Jewish law. This is the Abu Hav Synagogue, which uh, <coughs> was created in a way to reflect numerology, which is very important in some Jewish thinking. There are three uh, arcs to represent the three forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. There are four of this for the mothers. There are 12 of this for the, for the tribes. And it is also a very beautiful uh, synagogue. And while you're in spot, you might also like to peek into their wonderful art galleries where you can find really the best of Judaica. You can have a sort of spiritual experience, a fun one, by celebrating Purim. And yes, the kids get dressed up, but boy, the grown-ups, they really get into it. We saw the Queen of Hearts eating her hummus. We saw Batman carrying his twin babies. We saw uh, piranhas cycling down Dizengoth Street. It is a fun time. We went to uh, Shabbat services all three Saturday mornings that we were there. On the left, you see us. Uh, you see a a Reform synagogue in um, uh, Tel Aviv, and we happened to come on a day when there was a Bat Mitzvah being celebrated. Interesting to us was that everyone wore everyday clothes. They wore jeans and hoodies and sneakers. Only the bat mitzvah girl had a white dress on. And you see the little uh, girl in the front. What, what uh, fascinated me was how the children were just loved and stroked and treated with such affection, and they would go from one loving lap to another, and you didn't, couldn't really figure out who their parents were. But as soon as they got fussy, they were sent to another lap for a little change of scene. Steve and I are here in front of the... Um, great synagogue in Jerusalem. What a magnificent structure. All of the architecture was very vertical, raising your eye to a, a loft, and also the choir was unbelievable. 20 men who sang every part of the service, and it was just exquisite. Well, when you go to Jerusalem, or anywhere in fact, you should definitely have a Shabbat meal. And you can see our guide leading us in one. We were a little mishpucha. There were only 10 of us 
because we were the first group out after COVID. Only 10, where usually there are 35. And so we felt like a little family. And I might say that two of uh, the gals who traveled with us are online. Hi, Tony. Hi, Helen. <laughs> We're happy they're joining us. <laughs> and you can go to the wall and see people like these religious, but people of all types making their way to the wall on Shabbat. Here is a synagogue that has been constructed under the wall in the new tunnel explorations that are revealing so much about the site of the wall as it existed before. It's a beautiful little synagogue, I think. You can pray with all your heart as these women are doing. They are very seriously steeped in their prayers and cannot be distracted and it's beautiful to see. Or you can sing with all your heart. The young men on the top there, they are singing, and their song filled the entire plaza of the wall with gorgeous melodies. Or you can tuck a note into the wall to beseech God or to thank God. It is a very special experience to put your face, your hands on those cool stones and abandon your self-consciousness and just pray to or communicate with whatever force speaks to you about what is innermost in your heart. The final slide is one which shows a ranking of happiness. Israel in 2021 was ranked the ninth happiest country in the world. That's a UN ranking. So you have to ask yourself, <clears throat> how can we explain the happiness of a country that is continuously under mortal danger and is so often portrayed as an emblem of evil living under constant emotional strain? How can Israelis be happy when there is an active boycott movement against their country when Iran is going nuclear and threatening to wipe them off the map, when the UN has condemned Israel more times than all other nations combined, including countries where atrocities are committed every day. Perhaps it's because Israelis have one of the longest life expectancies of any nation in the world. Perhaps it's because their country has a history of enlightenment with the highest production of scientific publications per capita in the whole world, more museums per capita, and the highest worldwide publication of new books of any country in the world. In a small country with just nine million people, Israel in the last few years has seen five Israeli Nobel Prize winners. 13 since its founding. Perhaps it's because it's economically successful despite having no natural resources. And perhaps because while there are deep internal divides between the ultra-Orthodox and the secular, and the nationalists and the progressives, and all the problems with Judea and Sumeria that they must face, Israelis believe that there is a higher meaning and purpose to their lives and they have a deep and abiding attachment to their ancient land. Israel, with its radical ideas, was a miracle in the ancient world, and it's a miracle again today. So now we would like to open um, the, oh, thank you. <laughs> like to open the floor for any questions. I don't know if you wrote them and gave them to Susan or if they were there were any in the chat. Okay, well, does anyone simply want to ask a question? <laughs> oh. oh, okay, great, thank you. Uh, I do want to say um, Jerry, I do have a wrap up. Okay. Uh, Jerry, may, yep. may wrap, I? Yes, you have a wrap I up? Sure. Yes, is that okay? Yep, yep. Okay. It's expected. Okay. Go for <laughs> it. 
So we'd like to invite you to, um, uh, well, okay, so we, we, no one had a final comment, but um, yes, takeaways. So um, Steve and I were talking, what is our ultimate takeaway from our trip? Yeah, so Steve, what's yours? Well, in one sense, it's just the gestalt. Is this microphone on? Is it? Okay. I get a little closer. In, in one sense, it's just the gestalt of the Jewish people. Uh, when you're there, you're, you're not in the minority. You're in the majority. And I'm talking more about Jewish religiously and culturally. This is not racist because there's all kinds of races there, uh, r races there, uh, and it's 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 a type of spirit that's reflected all throughout. And this is one of the differences. When I said at the beginning, you don't know if you've left the United States or not. Uh, there's a different spirit there that they're 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 doing something uh, that's extra special. And they feel good about it. They're willing to help you. They're willing to talk to you. They're proud of their country. And they know the direction they're going. Uh, and and they, they put their lives on the line for it. I think that's the most overall. The, the individual things that you can see there, that you can see in the United States, I think Philadelphia has almost as much culture as Tel Aviv, uh, maybe not the nightclubs, but we don't have the ancient history and the ancient connections. Uh, I walked away there, I've already felt that way, but feeling, yeah, there, this, the state of Israel, the, the Israel is, is so much part of Judaism. I know Elaine said earlier that it was the 74th anniversary. That's of modern Israel. It's about 3,425 or so years of Eretz Israel, and I really walked away with that feeling. Hmm. Bev? Uh, okay, uh, the question was, since we had such a wonderful and moving experience and loved it so, did it occur to us to move to Israel? No. I would wish we had a nice little pied-à-terre that we could go to uh, once a year or so. But, of course, a move is, is a very big thing. However, I will say that I could imagine living there. But it's very hard to leave family, children, and all your roots at our age. But there, one of the women who traveled with us had made Aliyah, and uh, she was on our tour because she had just made Aliyah and hadn't had the opportunity to actually see the land of Israel. But uh, she had done that, and she was uh, our age in her 70s. That was a good question. Uh, uh, Elaine and I do feel the same way about that, but I will say with things going on, it's not hard to imagine uh, a, a, a time, maybe not in our lifetime, where it's nice to know there's a place for Jews to go, which yes. there wasn't before. That is very important, and I think my overwhelming takeaway was just this feeling that I am so proud to be part of a people who created a country like this. I feel very, very, very proud to be a Jew and to know that my people have created such a miraculous country. Um, now, uh, we would like to encourage you, if you're interested, to join our Israel Connectors Committee. We said that Ned is our chairperson, and um, the purpose of Israel Connectors is to uh, bring the profile of Israel into higher relief in Road of Shalom. I want to uh, let everyone know that on Sunday, May 15th, through our committee, we are having a celebration of Yom Ha'atzma'ut, 
Israel Independence Day. It will be at 1230, right at the entrance uh, on Green Street. We are going to have Israeli dancing uh, taught by Rock Don Entertainment with yummy Israeli food. And we encourage everyone to come. People of all ages are welcome. And the dances will be taught. So feel free, even if you don't know Israeli dancing, to come and join us. You'll have a great time. Okay. Um, I want to say a very sincere thank you to Susan and to Ray and again to Ellen. Please fill out the feedback form that you will be mailed. I want to also mention that the genesis of this program was a travel log that I had written and sent to some f to family and some friends at RS and they felt that something should be done with this travel log and here we are. <laughs> So that travelogue will be mailed to you after this program. And if you'd like to read it, that would be great. It's quite different from our presentation. It's more personal. And uh, we welcome you to enjoy it. Um, Days of Learning will continue through this Friday. Please check the RS website and do register for these excellent classes. Jerry? No, you took my job away. You, you oh. said everything. <laughs> I just have one correction. <laughs> they do have natural resource. Brains. It's, that's their natural resource. Uh, thank you so much. That was just terrific. I mean, I've been to Israel so many times. I lived there for a year, but you really summed it up. I don't think there was anything you left out. <laughs> so thank you for bringing back such great memories. And for people that have not been there, you should work for, uh, for a travel agent or for the state of Israel to encourage people to go because you could sell ice to an Eskimo. I mean, you were... Really terrific. Thank you so much. And Jerry was one of the people, along with Ellen and Stan Poster, who prepared us for our trip by telling us places to go, and that was a great help to us. So thank you, everyone. Please feel free to um, uh, shut down now, and if you feel those who are here and would like to have some more Israeli dinner, please enjoy yourself. There's lots. Thank you so much for coming.